whatever you did, you fixed it. Sounds great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's no no worries. After ten thousand five hundred shows, my ears are like uh, hawk ears. You've seen it. You've seen it all. <laughs> Listen, I have great hearing, and I have a nose that could get me a job in a uh, perfume factory. It's big, so, you know, what do you expect? And uh, I picked my nose over the years, so that freed up some sensory nerves, and so I'm, I'm good to go. I just wish I had eagle vision, because I don't. I wear contacts. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Uh, if you have picked your nose or you've done cocaine, you may have good smelling too. But I didn't do coke. I'm just saying, for the record. <laughs> the only coke I've used is I drank Coca-Cola. So, amen to that. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey, folks, we're excited to be here with Evangelist Michael W. Smith of HardcoreChristianity.com. And, Michael, welcome back, my friend. You want to open us in prayer? Uh, thank you for letting me be on the show again. Lord Jesus, uh, consider it a privilege to be on Omega Man and uh, a greater privilege to take a look at your word, which is the greatest thing in the world by far. And so uh, I want to help my friends on Omega Man and uh, give a good testimony for you and for Shannon. So I know that'll happen if you have the Holy Ghost bless me today. And that's when it happens, when he when he shows up. So by faith in Jesus' name, I'll receive that. Amen. Hey, I say amen to that. Michael, the microphone is yours. Welcome, my friend. Say, so, yeah, I wanted to do something uh, a little different today with your permission. Um, yes. I wanted, to, I wanted to look at some... Um, verses in the Bible that have caused enormous trouble over the years and try to explain them so that people understand them because they, um, you know, there's some scriptures that have been uh, enormously misinterpreted that uh, if you actually knew what the scripture was saying, uh, the, the enlightenment would be, uh, would be remarkable. If, is that okay with you? Absolutely. You got you got my curiosity peaked. Go for it, my brother. Well, let let's do uh, one major disaster. <clears throat> I'm reading out of the King James Bible, but several of the other translations also screwed up these verses. And so if they first John chapter three has left uh, you know, severe damage. Of course it was written perfectly and it's a, a tremendous revelation, but we uh, when interpreting it, uh, we jacked the thing up. But uh, the good news is, if you uh, look at it correctly, the verse is enormously encouraging and will remove uh, the power of the spirit of rejection that most people picked up if they were raised in a dysfunctional family. Rejection spirits uh, are the main demon that Satan sends the people who are raised in a dysfunctional family that have a, you know, jacked up parents or step parents or what have you. And uh, this rejection demon loves this verse, these verses. He loves them because he knows they were misinterpreted and he goes with the interpretation of them in most of the uh, Bibles. But I, we can cut him at, down at the knees today if we actually uh, explain it the way it was actually written in the Greek text. Uh, is that okay with you? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, if you look at First John chapter 3, it appears to be a monumental disaster, but it actually isn't. It's spectacular. First John chapter 3, verse 6. Okay? And, uh, and I hope your friends... Uh, might take some notes on this, if possible. That would be great. It says, um, in, in the King James Bible, <clears throat> whoever abides in him sins not. Okay, right out of the gate, now we've got major problems. Not even finishing the first sentence, the devil just uh, hit one over the fence. 
the only way to interpret this text is to take a look at the Greek text and to understand what verbs are being used and what kinds of verbs they are. In uh, the way this was translated by the uh, King James translators, they didn't do that. What it actually says here is uh, the Greek word for abide there is mene. Mene is a continuous uh, active tense verb. In other words, if I abided in your house, if you invited me over for dinner, and the way this reads here, it says I would come into your house, have dinner, and then I would leave. But that's, act, that's not how it's written. It says here that I come over to your house and I continuously stay there for dinner, breakfast, lunch, breakfast, lunch, dinner, forever, so is what this is actually saying. Mene is a continuous tense Greek verb. So that really what this sentence says is whoever repetitively and continuously remains in Christ doesn't sin. But whoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. So the second sentence in the verse also is causing nothing but trouble, but actually it's a great revelation. What it's really saying there is whoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. All right, the Greek word for sins there is not uh, the regular Greek word hamartia, it's hamartano, present continuous tense behavior. So what this is really saying is whoever continuously and repetitive remains in Christ does not sin, and whoever repetitively and continuously sins has not seen him, horao is the Greek word, it means has not discerned him correctly, and neither has known him, Gnosko is the Greek word for known there, and that means to understand. So what John is saying here, back in, back in his day, like ours, there were many Christians who were professing Christ and who believed in Jesus, for example, like the Pharisees. Jesus had many Pharisees that believed in him, but they were afraid to say anything because they didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. Well, those people were not true believers, and Jesus was very hard on them. Well, here, here the word is telling, telling you that whoever on a continuous, repetitive basis remains in Christ won't sin, and whoever repetitively and continuously sins hasn't properly discerned him or does not understand him. And then he says, little children, no man, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Well, the Greek word there again for does is poion, which is a continuous tense verb. And it should read, he that practices repetitively and continuously practices righteousness is righteous. So you can see here that John is talking about Christians who are dedicated and who have turned their life over to the Lord and are literally living and walking by faith as opposed to the Pharisees who believed in Jesus but were afraid to say anything because they get kicked out of the synagogue. And then it says in the verse, the next verse, he that commits sin is of the devil. Well, the demons interpreted this verse and told everybody, oh, you sinned, you're of the devil. You're, that's not what it's saying. Uh, if a Christian sins, that doesn't mean they're of the devil. Uh, I've never met a Christian who doesn't sin. I sin. You probably sin once in a while. What it actually is saying is, he that commits sin, poion, same Greek word, meaning he who is repetitively practicing and living in sin is of the devil. Greek word ek comes out of the devil. 
that repetitive sinful lifestyle is coming out of Satan. And then he says, for the devil sinned from the beginning. The Greek word for sin there is also a present active tense verb. The devil practiced and repetitively sinned from the beginning. And then it says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, the Greek word for destroy there is not the regular Greek word luo, it's luce. Luce is an aorist active tense verb, meaning that in the past, Jesus loosed the works of the devil and is on a repetitive, continuous basis loosing the works of the devil. Luo means to loose or unchain, unloose somebody, untie somebody, unchain them. So what this is saying is for the born-again Christian who's repetitively practicing and living in righteousness and serving Christ, that person is not living in sin. And just like the devil, he said he lived in sin from the beginning. And the purpose of the Lord Jesus was to loose the works of the devil. He loosed them at Calvary. It's an aorist tense active verb. He loosed them at Calvary, and he is continuously loosing them now in your Christian life. Because you're walking continuously with God. You are not practicing sin. It doesn't say you didn't sin. Later on, as you know, John said, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. He's talking about Christians who you and I know and who I counsel all the time in my counseling practice. People who are practicing Christians who are living in sin. They're practicing living in sin. And they come to see me for counseling because they want to get delivered from demons or they want to get physically healed. And this issue has to be uh, addressed first. And you can see why. Uh, if you go to YouTube, you have all these guys casting demons out of people. And in the long run, most of them are actually hurting people, not helping them. Because... The sin issue has not been dealt with. If you blow demons out of somebody at a shopping mall or in a park or at a Walmart parking lot, okay, the demons are coming out of the person and temporarily they feel better. But because they have not renewed their mind and their behavior and their sin life has not changed, the spirits just simply get back in and the last state of the man is worse than the first. The last state of the man is worse than the first. So when you're doing deliverance, the proper method of doing it is you got to preach repentance first. It's not as important to name the demons. Oh, that's, that's Jezebel. That's Ahab. Okay, that's okay to do. But if you're not including repentance in the system, if you, if you cast a bunch of demons out of somebody because you have a nice anointing, in the long run, you may be actually hurting them because the person has to understand that spirits feed on sin. They feed on negative emotions. They feed on negative thoughts. So that if a person gets delivered but doesn't renew their mind and doesn't repent of their sin and stop living a sinful lifestyle, like John is talking about here in First John chapter 3, they're just going to get reinfected. And they could get worse than before you met them in the parking lot or you blew the demons out at the mall or at an altar at a deliverance service. You have The anointing is there. Demons are coming out of people. That's good news. But the bad news is they have to teach and, re- and preach repentance before, during, and after deliverance. That's the most important thing. A person has to 
change their life and change how they think and change their beliefs, their attitudes, which will then affect their behavior in order to keep the demons out. Because we know that when you cast a demon out of somebody, they always try to get back in. Now, wouldn't you, if you were a demon, that's your job to take that person and the way spirits see human beings, as you know, they see them as a house, Matthew 12. It said when a spirit came back to his house, he noticed that the house was all cleaned up and decorated and rearranged and was looking and smelling great. Fantastic. So then he goes and gets more spirits, and then they come back. And since the house had wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost and the Word of God, and the person hadn't renewed their mind and they hadn't repented of their sin, the, a whole bunch of more demons get back in and they get sicker. They get sicker. So, since that movie came out, Come Out in Jesus' Name, that was a major event in the United States. That thing was absolutely fantastic. Since that movie came out, a lot of people have seen kind of the glamour life of deliverance. Oh, this looks glamorous. Look, the Holy Spirit's moving. Oh, gosh, that guy's puking. Oh, look at that one. He's levitating. Yeah, it, it is kind of a show. But, but the problem is the demons uh, get you to emphasize the, the, the manifestations, and they don't want you to emphasize the repentance aspect of deliverance. That's our goal. They want to put on a big show, and later on the person gets super sick again. You know, I have a, I, I have a minister here in Arizona, a guy named Bob Larson. He's over in Scottsdale. Bob's been around for years, and many years ago, back in the early 90s, really Bob Larson uh, did, did a fantastic work. He... Um, made the United States churches aware that demons existed. He was kind of the godfather of demons in the United States in terms of mass media. Uh, He used to have a radio show back in the early 90s when he moved here from Denver. And he used to cast demons out of people on the radio. You know, it was sensationalism and it was wow and unbelievable. I went to several of his services. But God showed me that the sensationalism of deliverance is an asset to demons because they get the people to focus on the manifestations and, and not the repentance that's required to keep them out. And so when Bob has a service, you can see he's an extremely strong guy, strongest deliverance person I've ever seen. And he gets in these big fights with demons. He starts, they just get in a, you know, an old-fashioned, to use a slang term, a pissing match. And they're fighting and yelling at each other and grumbling. And uh, Well, that makes for good theater. And that's, that's interesting to watch. And you might sell some books and tapes over it, CDs, different things. The problem is uh, Bob is not preaching or teaching repentance as the main uh, focus of his ministry, repenting of sin. And so that's what John's talking about here. What he's really saying is, he's not saying that Christians don't sin. Of course they sin. What he's saying is, do they make a practice of it? Is it a repetitive, continuous thing? And what John is saying here is that if they are doing that, if they are doing it, they don't understand Christ and they're not discerning the life of Christ properly. They're not getting it. If that, does that make sense? Maybe I ought to stop here because I'm, am I confusing? Is this confusing? Oh, no, sir. Um, everything you know, okay? Everything, everything is okay. And um, I would just tack on, um, I remember uh, seeing Bob Larson on, sometimes interviewed on uh, TBN, and uh, it was probably, I would say probably somewhere around 98 or so I first heard about him, 
And I was just fascinated. I said, man, this is exciting. I'd like to get some of these books. And uh, I followed him over the years. Had him on the program maybe 10 years ago. Met him one time. And uh, I will give him kudos where credit is due. Uh, he's done probably more uh, deliverances than anybody I've, I've ever heard of. Uh, but you're right. Uh, it's one thing to demonstrate uh, deliverance, but uh, there needs to be some training. And uh, without repentance, well, it's an open door for demons in it. Back to you. Well, uh, to follow up on what you just said, that was a, that's exactly correct. What happened was Bob's a very intelligent person, and uh, he's, he's very strong. He's, he's the toughest guy you'll ever meet in the deliverance field. I mean, guy, he's still doing it. And he's in his late 70s. He's a remarkable person. But what happened, this was decades ago, he went on a mission trip to Africa, and I forgot what country he went to. But when he got over there, he saw major manifestations of demons among these African churches. And he was amazed, to use the term you just used. You were amazed. He was too. He couldn't believe that. And when he came back, he said, I wonder if there are demons in Americans, are there demons in America? Do people have have demons? And that's how he got started. He saw the voodoo, the witch doctors, and so on. And they had they had major manifestations. Everything, you know, screaming, body changes, levitation. I mean, he saw everything. And he says, "Hey, that's you know that dog will hunt." Well, the problem was. Bob, the devil tricked Bob into um, writing books. He, he's written like 50 books. The guy's a prolific author. And uh, he taught in his TV shows and everything, to f- he focuses on manifestations. And sometimes in the shows, he doesn't even mention the word repentance. It's not even mentioned. He will call out demons by name, and uh, he will get them aggravated, and then they get in a big argument, and they get in a fight, and then they then they're staring each other down, and they get nose to nose in the battle, you know. And you know, Bob's the toughest guy you ever met. But again, the problem is, so many of his people get reinfected, and I, I've had hundreds of them come to me after they've been through uh, Larson deliverances. And a lot of people come to me who've seen Come Out in Jesus' Name. And uh, that movie was amazing, utterly amazing. People were manifesting in the theater. Some Christians were casting demons out of people right in the movie theater. Uh, the movie theater, people hated it because you know you got people puking on the floor and everything. That's a major cleanup job. But the problem was the people were not given the truth. The truth is... Sin, let these spirits in your body, and sin will let them re-enter your body. That's how this system works. Demons feed on sin. You know, it's like a poltergeist. Somebody in the house committed a horrible or grave evil in that house and drew in poltergeists, spirits that took over the house. And they had legal rights to have that house. So then, you know, the new buyers come in and all of a sudden there's a bunch of weird stuff going on. And so sin allows spirits to take ground uh, in humans and in homes and things like that. It's amazing. Demons live in people's homes and they, they own those homes. And sometimes when a true man or woman of God comes to visit or stays there for some time, they'll attack that person in dreams. They'll attack them with sleep paralysis. Uh, the person will wake up in the middle of the night kind of paralyzed and they can't breathe. They're trying to say Jesus, can't get it out. And that they're visiting in this person's home. Well, the demons, this is their home. They own that home. And sin allows them to be the landlord of the home. And so when the person goes through repentance, And changes their life, their attitude, how they think, develops the mind of Christ. When that happens, the demons lose their hold and they're they're easy to cast out. And right here it says it, for this purpose, 
was the Son of God manifested, John, 1 John chapter 3, that he might loose, he loosed and continuously looses the works of the devil. Then John says, whoever is born of God does not commit sin. Okay, now this sentence in the King James Bible is a major problem and has hurt untold numbers of people because the demons interpret it exactly the way it's written. It's, but that's not what the verse is saying. It says here, whoever is born of God, ganao is the Greek word. It's the same Greek word used in John chapter 3 when Jesus said, you must be born again. It means to be generated or born from above. It says, whoever is truly born again, truly has the Holy Spirit. All born-again Christians have the Holy Spirit in their spirit man. That's what makes them born again. Not their mind or their belief in Christ, but their Holy Spirit living inside their spirit man, inside their inner man. They have the Holy Ghost. That, that means you're born again. That's actually a spiritual experience you can actually have and feel. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. It's not saying that. So people and the devil have condemned themselves. They condemn themselves because they committed a sin. No, poion is the Greek word. It's a continuous tense Greek verb. Commit. Practices on a continuous basis. Whoever is born of God does not practice repetitively and continuously sinning. That's what it actually says in the Greek, not what the King James translated it as. And there's a major difference. If I translate it correctly, you can see someone with a rejection demon from childhood. When the person reads this sentence, the rejection demon is going to manifest right on the spot and say, oh, you're not a Christian. You committed a sin. You, you, you sinned yesterday. You yelled at your dad. You, you, sinned, you, you just yelled at your wife an hour ago. You sinned. You're not a Christian. And so that guilt trip is what the demons put on the people. They hit them with guilt they hit them with shame. They hit them with regrets. That's the trifecta of rejection demons. Guilt, shame, and regret. And so when I have somebody in a counseling session for deliverance, I got to get them to understand that because they sinned, the love of God is still available for them and the grace of God is still available for them and they are born-again Christians if they are not continuously, chronically practicing sin. That's what it says. And then John says, quote, his seed remains in him. Remain is, uh, once again, mene, it's a continuous tense verb, remains, constantly stays within him, continuously stays in him. His seed you're not, you don't lose your salvation like you dropped your keys. Oh, I'm unsaved. Oh my gosh, I sinned. I, I said a, I said a curse word. Oh no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saved anymore. Oh no. Well, naturally, the rejection demon is going to jump all over you, lying to you and telling you you're not saved. You never were saved. You're not a Christian. Look, it says it right here. Look at this, you moron. He that commits sin is, is, is of the devil. You committed a sin. What's wrong with you? And so that guilt trip that the demons lay on people, they, use, they, they take these te scriptures and they, they uh, use the fact that they weren't translated clearly because a, a demon will do anything to get a human being not to see what's true. They'll use anything, even the Bible. They love the Bible. They got it memorized from pillar to post. And then it says, listen to this sentence. He cannot sin because he's born of God. Well, that makes Christianity sound like it's a carnival. What do you mean? He can, I'm born again? I can't sin? You can see how that was per, poorly translated 
it says sin, pre- present continuous tense. You, a born again Christian, truly born again Christian, is not going to chronically, continuously live in sin. They're not going to do it. They're going to ask for forgiveness. They're going to try to repent. They're going to try to get help. That's not going to happen. Someone who's not born of God, that's a different story. They will continuously and repetitively live in sin. So you can see how this sentence was misinterpreted. And it's easy to misinterpret it because that's what it says. He cannot sin. That's not what it's saying. It's, he's saying that a true born-again Christian with the Holy Ghost cannot repetitively and regularly, on a continuous basis, live in sin. You can't do that. That's a, As Ray Comfort in California would say, that's a false convert. Then it says, quote, whoever does not righteousness is not of God. Neither is he that loves not his brother. Well, once again, these are continuous tense verbs. And whoever does not righteousness is not of God. Poyon, whoever practices and repetitively lives in sin and doesn't practice righteousness is not of God. Well, no kidding. That's He's talking about somebody who's a sinner. Someone who continuously and repetitively lives in sin. So John is bifurcating his teaching. He's saying, now look, these are converts to Christ who profess they're saved, but in reality, they're continuously on a regular basis practicing living in sin, even though they're big Jesus fans and they're saying, I, I, I believe in Christ. I love, I love Christ. Jesus is great. Amen. He's, he's separating the two. This is what the great apostle James does in, in uh, chapter 2 in his epistle where he talks about faithful outworks of the dead. That makes sense to and me. And then he says, is this making any sense or can I, should I stop here? No, absolutely not. Keep going. In other words, uh, no, keep keep. Uh, keep teaching. I just want to say uh, that makes sense now that you explained it. Back to you. It says here, John chapter 3, 6 through 10. First John, excuse me. It says here, his seed, meaning Christ, remains in him. Remains in him. Mene, continuous active tense. Yeah, once you're born again, you receive the Holy Spirit. That's the seed of God, the Holy Ghost. And this, the Word of God that the Holy Spirit wrote is God's seed. And it does. It remains, it remains in you on a continuous, um, regular tense, even though you committed a sin. Just because you sin doesn't mean that you are out of fellowship with God, or you were never saved. That's not what he's saying. Christians who sin still have the grace and love of God. And because of the grace of God, the option to fix that is always on the table. And the Holy Spirit's always ready, willing, and able to restore somebody, but a rejection demon, he'll go the opposite direction. He will try to condemn you and run you into the ground, and then he will point out, using scripture, you're not even a Christian. You're fake. You're a false convert. You don't love God. You suck. He'll just run you into the ground. And then it says, he cannot sin because he's born of God. That's not what it says. That was mistranslated. In this, he says, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Of course they are. This group of people who are born of God is not practicing and repetitively living in sin versus this group of people who were not born of God who are regularly practicing living in sin. Even though verbally, James chapter 2, they may say 
they have faith and say they love Christ, but actually they're still unsaved and rotten to the core. See the difference there? He's bifurcating it. In this, the children of God are manifested versus the children of the devil. Well, what, what are those two? Is it because the children of God can't sin and never sin? Of course not. Of course no. I've been doing this for years. I have never met a Christian that hasn't sinned. Have you? I mean, if somebody knows somebody that do, that never sins, who's a Christian, I'd like their phone number. I'd like to have their name, please. I need to give them a call. No, he's saying, Chris, you're still a born-again Christian. You're still loved by God. You still have the grace of God, even though you sinned. The concept John is explaining to the saints is, is is this person repetitively, actively living in sin? Are they living in sin? Is what he's saying. Which the children of the devil do. They repetitively and regularly practice living in sin. Poi A. Then he says, whoever does not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loves not his brother. Well, now here we're in trouble again. What it actually says is whoever does not poyong repetitively and consistently practice righteousness is not of God. Well, of course they're not. Of course they're not of God. Anybody who continuously and practicing repetitively sinful lifestyle isn't of God. Duh. Then he says, neither is he that does not love his brother. Okay, now here we go again. We got problems we got to fix. Agapon is the Greek word that is a continuous active tense verb meaning to show love to your brother. That's what it means. It says, neither is he that does not, on a regular basis, continuous basis, show love for your brother. It doesn't mean that you had a bad day and your brother in Christ came to you and you answered them wrong, you responded wrong, and you you didn't help them, and you failed. That's not what that's talking about. See, it's talking about a lifestyle, a continuous behavior. A repetitive behavior. Nobody, no Christian, loves their brothers perfectly. If they do, I'd like their name and phone number. Everybody has faults and everybody fails. And every Christian sins. But the question is this. Here's what John's saying. Do you make that a repetitive and continuous practice in your life? If you did, if you do, he's saying you are not discerning Christ and you do not understand Christ. John, 1 John 3, 6 through 10. Uh, Do you think that helps or did I explain it too confusingly? Oh, no, this certainly helps. Yes, sir. What, what I'm trying to get your friends to understand is that don't get down on yourself. If you fail, you don't do something right, you sin, you had a bad day, you dropped your keys, damn it, you let out a curse word, whatever it is, okay? God is not condemning you. God is not angry at you. He has not, he has not turned on you. The rejection demon has. He's trying to pound this in so you will have shame and guilt and regret. That's the trifecta of the rejection demon. If he can get those three things into your soul, and your soul's where your emotions are, if he can get those into your mind and your soul, he can wipe out your Christian life. He'll destroy you. He'll win. He knows he'll win. He's got you. And then if he uses... uh, Poorly translated verses, like they are here in the King James Bible, 
And believe me, King James wasn't the only one that missed this. I've looked this up in a half a dozen other Bibles. It's still screwed up. The demons will use these scriptures to condemn you. They love that. That's their favorite thing. The second favorite thing is getting other people at church to condemn you. Those, those are the big two. If they can get a Bible verse to, to condemn you that hasn't been translated clearly, or they can get somebody at church to condemn you, criticize you, or run you down, that they will crush you. They'll, they'll smash you. Big time. Now, I want to share one more thing. <clears throat> if you go down in the same chapter there, there's another scripture in verse 21 and 22 that is mind-boggling and that has caused enormous problems. Here's what it says. King James, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. For whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Okay, that's the verse. That's how the verse reads. But we got major problems with that verse. Here's why. Quote, beloved, if our heart condemns us not. Now, here is what the rejection demon does best. Kataganoske is the Greek word. It means to be a self-inflicted fault finder. Someone who doesn't feel they're worthy. Someone who doesn't like themselves. Someone who uh, is critical of themselves. Somebody who grew up with uh, in a family environment where people were criticized, or they were criticized, or they were run down, or someone who, uh, let's say, went to grade school and was a subject of, of uh, long-term bullying, right? A fault finder, a nitpicker of self. That's what that Greek word means. And it's in a present active tense, meaning that it, you're continuously on a regular basis finding fault with yourself, Okay, well, obviously, a person that does that is not going to be confident towards God's attitude toward them. They're going to feel like he is doing the same thing you're doing, nitpicking you, criticizing you, finding fault with you. And your Heavenly Father does not do that. He doesn't do it. That's the rejection demon, the monster from childhood. I'm telling you, this spirit is so dangerous, you can't even believe it. And I have to face him every single week in my counseling practice. There's a week go by, I don't have to face this stinking spirit. Because he gets in to families that are dysfunctional, and kids who have bad parents, adopted parents, step-parents, what have you. So, then it says, quote, Whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Okay, now we got major problems here. The rejection demon jumps on this text and he goes, hey, you're not keeping all the commandments of God, are you? Okay. Well, there's no point in praying. After all, look at what kind of a person you are. You're a loser. You're a failure. You stink. You suck. Look at your parents. Look at your family. Look at all the bad choices you made. Look at your regrets. Let's go over those in detail. Oh, look. Oh, there you go. Look at that wife. Look at this one. Oh, you're in your third marriage. Oh, that's not going well. The, the rejection demon chronically and systematically criticizes and nitpicks born-again Christians. And he does that so that when they go to God, they feel unworthy to ask for help. Or if they do ask for help, doubt creeps in and wipes out their prayer. Right? Because Jesus specifically said in Mark in, in Mark 11, he said, listen, if you look at this mountain and you tell it to cast itself into the sea, and you do not doubt the mountain will be removed. Doubt wipes out your prayers. Doubt mops up your prayers. And so if this rejection demon can use these scriptures to get you to doubt, oh, hey, you're not keeping all the commandments. You're not doing everything correct. You missed a couple. Look, you kept that one, but you didn't get this one. Oh, look, you kept those two, but you didn't kept keep these two. 
So he'll nitpick you. And it's easy to do because he's already trained you, as it says in this verse, if our heart does not condemn us. Condemn us meaning self-inflicted fault finding. That's what that Greek word means. Kanagonoske. It's in a continuous tense verb. That means you, on a repetitive basis, probably from childhood, are always nitpicking yourself and, see, and seeing that the glass is always half empty, not half full. And obviously, that person, that Christian, isn't going to have any confidence toward God because they're not understanding, hey, you, you're not keeping all the commandments of God. Okay, Well, join the club. Join the club. Okay, I don't either. I don't keep 100% of the commandments of God. Myself, I need grace. I need love. 100%. But if I'm going to continuously nitpick or find fault with myself, I'm not going to want to come to God and ask for help. And if I do ask for help, I'm not going to believe he's going to help me. I'm going to start doubting. And therefore, my mountain, which was supposed to be cast into the sea, because I doubted, stays right in front of my face and I got to keep climbing and doing everything I can to get over it. And it's wearing me out physically, spiritually, and emotionally. I'm being worn out by having to climb over this mountain that should have been booted into the sea long ago. But because I kept condemning myself, I doubted the love and mercy and grace of God. And therefore, I'm stuck at the bottom of this mountain having to climb over these rocks and the trees and all this other crap. And it's wearing me out. That's what this verse is saying. Then he says, quote, whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Do. There it is. Poyuman. We make a habit of practicing and doing what God wants us to do. It's not saying you do it perfectly or do it 100%. Nobody can do that. No one can live a sinless life perfectly. If you find somebody, I want the name and phone number, please send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I know a gal in uh, Pico Rivera, her name's Sally. She never sends. Okay, I want that name and address. What's Sally's phone number? I guarantee you when I call Sally, I'm going to make a fool out of her. That's not happening. Everybody has faults. God doesn't want you to nitpick your faults. He wants you to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. It says here you do the things, you practice the things that are pleasing in his sight. Okay? So, Shannon. Let's use Shannon. He got a great uh, Omega Man radio show. If I asked Shannon... Hey, do you live a perfect Christian life? The guy's going to be honest. He's got integrity. He'll tell me, no, I don't. I fail here. I fail there. I failed before. I make mistakes. Well, then I'll ask Shannon, hey, do you get your prayers answered? Yes, I do. I get a lot of my prayers answered. Of course you do because, because you're not constantly condemning yourself or finding fault with yourself. You understand that human beings... God understands our frailties. He understands our weaknesses, Romans chapter 8, and he prays for our weaknesses. And if any man sin, John says right in this book, if any man sin, we have a parakletos, an advocate with the Father. That's the same Greek word used to uh, describe the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14. Jesus used it. Parakletos is somebody who sees you're in trouble, and comes running to your side to support you. That's what a paracletus is. See, they, they call the Holy Spirit the paraclete. That's what it comes from, that Greek word. It means somebody who will run to see you, run to your side to help you, and stand by you and support you. And that's what he does. Not because you live a perfect Christian life, but because you're not practicing continuously, repetitively living in sin. See the difference? It's not that you sinned once or twice or you made a mistake or you failed, what have you. God is not condemning you for that. 
you can confess that and repent of it right away and, and be instantaneously forgiven, and that can be instantaneously washed in the blood. And it's gone. That's what an advocate does. That's a paracletus. Absolutely. That, I see it. Makes sense to me, Brother Michael. There, there's no reason for any born-again Christian to condemn themselves or nitpick themselves or find fault with themselves because if they do... Our confidence in God's ability to answer our prayers is going to tank. John just said it. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Well, conversely, if our heart does con- condemn us, okay, okay, if we do sit around nitpicking ourselves, highlighting our failures, going over our past sins, drumming up our regrets, what we're actually doing there is listening to the monster from childhood, the monster of America. Have you seen BLM? Have you seen Antifa? Do you know what that actually is? Rejection demons from childhood manifesting in violence. It's him. He's doing it. He's the root of all this. They find fault in themselves, and so they find fault in everybody else. They condemn themselves, so they condemn everybody else. How do they do that? They want they want vengeance. They want justice. They want condemnation. So you burn down a building, you riot, you destroy. That's that's the, their old friend from childhood, the rejection demon that was, got into your brain when your mother criticized you and your dad was yelling at you and your 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 dad took the belt to you and you know you got beat up in school and bullied in school. That's how he got in. And what he'll do is he'll nitpick you the rest of your life till you drop dead. And it won't stop until you're dead. If you don't stop this, if you don't get that demon out of there, and if you don't understand that your Heavenly Father is not a nitpicker, he is not a critical person, he's not criticizing you, he's not running you down, he wants to help you. He likes that. That's part of his personality. That's, that's what he does is help. He likes it. He enjoys it. So, and Michael, everybody, if I asked you, Shannon, do you have things you enjoy that you you like? You just give me a laundry list of stuff. You know, what, playing with the kids or going somewhere, doing this or doing that. Well, your Heavenly Father is exactly the same. He he likes certain stuff. He don't like other stuff. But what he really likes is mercy. See, mercy rejoices against judgment. And if you don't understand these scriptures, and, and admittedly, I'm not criticizing anybody, this, this text, the way they translated it, man, this is not good. This is going to cause a lot of problems in the body of Christ. And what I tried to do today on your show was try to uh, fix it. I was trying to illuminate it so that people understood that God is not running them down or, uh, or, or uh, condemning them if they fail or if they sin or if they screw up. Okay, he's not doing that. But John is saying, listen, if you know somebody who claims to be a Christian who is living, practicing, and repetitively sinning over and over again, hey, no, that person, that person is not born of God. That person is not a true spirit filled Christian. See the difference? That's what he's really saying. But if you just read the text the way this was translated, it doesn't sound like that. Absolutely. And so, so what you- any person who's a nitpicker, any person who's hopeless or lives with regrets, you can get out of that bondage today. You can leave that thing because your Heavenly Father has nothing to do with it. Nothing. What He sees when He looks at you is not a loser and a failure and a gutless wonder. He sees the Holy Ghost living in your spirit, man. And when he looks at you, he sees a reflection of himself. He looks inside you, he sees the Holy Ghost, and he looks at himself. He sees himself in there. And so since he sees himself in you, he's not going to sit around pointing his finger at you, nitpicking you and griping at you like your your parents did or your adopted parents did or the, 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 the federal government does. Everybody's always nitpicking and criticizing 
Father doesn't do that. He's not built like that. He wants to help you. He likes you. He loves you. cares about you. And if you listen to the rejection demon, you're not going to believe him. And if you don't believe him and you start doubting, your mountain will stay right in front of you and you're going to have to keep climbing that thing. And it's so exhausting. Carrying burdens. Carrying around offenses. Carrying around ought. Carrying around unforgiveness. Carrying around confusion. Those mountains are vicious. So what I'm getting out of this, Brother Michael, is uh, God doesn't throw us away when we sin. Uh, at the same right. time, you know, he gives us a space and time to repent. That's the mercy and grace of God. Now, right. let me ask you this question, however. Okay, and of course, as I understand it too, if people keep falling into the same sin and they know it's wrong um, and they they don't want to do it but they're just driven I think that's a, probably a good indicator they need some deliverance I remember when Worley talked about you know if you if you're harassed driven tormented and you know it's it's caught this compulsive behavior is reversing your spiritual growth and progress you need to come forward get some deliverance I've yes. always been a proponent for that. But let me ask you this question. Right. There are people out there that identify as being a Christian. And um, the, two, two groups. One, uh, they're living in fornication, for example, lifestyle. Girl with her boyfriend, guy with his girlfriend. They go to church. They say, I love Jesus. I'm a Christian. Yet they're fornicating. Um, right. Right. What do you say to that group who know that they're doing what they're doing is wrong, but at the same time they could confess that you know Jesus Christ is their Lord? Um, what do you say to that group who continue in that sin? Okay, now I, I see that uh, all the time. Uh, a couple will come in for counseling, for example. That's a routine case there. You have to investigate it further because. Uh, one couple came in, the woman was born again and had evidence of the Holy Spirit. The, the boyfriend did not. None at all. I interviewed both of them. Okay? So the woman was feeling conviction over not being married. She loved the guy and wanted to get married, but he didn't want to do it. He said, oh, there's nothing wrong with it. If you love each other, you can go ahead and to have intercourse, no problem. We're living together. I'm I'm faithful to you. You're faithful to me. He had all kinds of excuses. See that? So here he would fall into John chapter three. His attitude, his behavior, his thought pattern, obviously was sinful. Correct, but right. hers was not. She was living with the guy but wanted to get out of it and wanted to quit it. All right? So then Galatian applies. Whatever a man or woman sows, that's what they're going to reap. And so I had to explain to her that even though you love him and even though you want to be with him and you want to get married, if you continue in this lifestyle, the demons are going to butcher you because you're committing adultery even though you don't want to do it you're doing it and the devil is going to come for you he already had the the boyfriend see absolutely and I'll go as far as to say that's how you do it what what you got to do is analyze it on a case per case basis you can't just generalize and say um, that because somebody's doing something that it's this if that makes sense you got to kind of take people on an individualized basis and that's what John's doing here in chapter 3 I, I see people um, that have been in the church they made a decision for Christ yet they get tempted and they uh, take the bait they fall into sin it happened to me growing up in the church premarital sex 
And um, I believe grace and mercy is a space and time repent. But I would still also say these people that are in these relationships. Uh, God does not condone fornication, just like he doesn't condone, condone a whole list of sins, homosexuality, drunkenness, adultery, etc. Correct. And you're playing literally with your, you're playing with fire. You need to repent, get out of that situation. Right. Because if you were to right. die tonight in that sin, you're going to bust tail wide open. Word of God says fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. And um, it's dangerous to know that you're sinning and to continue into that. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day of repent. Um, right. Again, don't play with it. There are people that will repent. The Lord will forgive them. And you get out of that situation. And there's others that will continue in that. Thinking, well, God will give them a pass. Do you think God gives people a pass when they continue in willful sin and then, uh, God forbid, they died in that sin? What do you think happens to that person? Well, again, you got to take it on an individualized basis. Now, let's, let's uh, focus what you just said. You said that you had seen people at church who had received Christ and had fallen into temptation. Remember that? You just said that about a minute ago. Yes. I saw, I've, ago. I've seen it Remember before. That? I've experienced yeah. it. And, you, and I know people you, you, in real you, time right now yeah. who will tell you that yeah. they're a Christian, but they're living with their boyfriend. They're not married. They're having sex. Right. Right. And so, uh, first of all, what I, what I would do is... A, analyze whether or not that person that you just mentioned, hypothetically, yes. is actually born again. Because some people who say they're saved and receive Christ, like John is talking about here in chapter 3, or what James is talking about in chapter 2, people who say they have faith, but they don't actually have any faith because there's no fruit. So number one, you got to make sure the person was actually born again and has the Holy Spirit. Number two, I explained to the person that God is not going to walk over there and bash them over their heads. That the law of sowing and reaping is going to catch them. And they're going to get hurt and hurt bad. Because the law of sowing and reaping is the same as gravity. It's just as powerful and just as real. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. So what will happen is, and you've seen this before, God will give grace and mercy to somebody until they get the truth. So when they come into my office and I explain to them, here's what the Bible is actually saying, and here's the risk that you're running. You're going to reap what you sow. After they receive the truth, the Bible teaches, and Jesus specifically said it, he that is given much, much is required. And so once you get the truth and you don't do it and you reject it, the demons then have what some preachers call legal rights to move in on you. Yes. And that's what you're talking about when, you're, when you were describing that hypothetical case. They were going to get in big trouble. That's what it is. It's big trouble. Oh, so absolutely. when I explained to that couple, she, she was a born-again Christian and had spiritual fruit. She wanted to repent. She was sincere. He wasn't even saved. She, she had made the horrible mistake of getting involved and falling in love with an unsaved person, which is unscriptural. We are not to be unequally yoked. You can't, That's right. a Pentecostal can't marry a Baptist, a sinner can't marry a saint, you know, a, a Catholic can't mar- marry, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't work like that. You guys are not on the same page. A Pentecostal is totally different from a Baptist. They have different beliefs. They have different concepts of evangelism. They have different types of faith. They're, 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 not, they're unequally yoked. And this girl had moved in with this guy, and they loved each other, but he wasn't even born again. So she was unequally yoked. So I had to explain that to her and explain to her why the law of sowing and reaping was eventually going to catch her. Mercy only goes to a certain point, and then Satan's judgment falls on the person. Absolutely, and it could fall 
tomorrow. Who knows what lays yeah. in store for a person? Don't play right. with fire, folks, or play Russian roulette. Um, it's not worth it. Um, and there is, I think, an extreme uh, form of grace out there. You know, uh, I can go out and commit sin tonight and just ask the Lord for forgiveness tomorrow. Premeditated sin. Now, that's a very dangerous place to be. Very. Have, have you run into people like that? All the time. Uh, thousands of times. Now, I have to explain to them. Now, look. Grace has been following you and you are not reaping what you're sowing but that runs out it ran out on King Saul it ran out on Balaam it ran out on Alexandria and uh, it ran out on these people that you know the guy at church was, that was living with his stepmom married his stepmom or something Paul said, get that guy out of there. He's going to spread lust demons all through the congregation. Get him out. And then they did. They, they, they got the letter, 1 Corinthians, they booted the guy out. Okay. The law of sowing and reaping fell on him. And Satan. Uh, Paul said, let Satan take, it, take him to the whipping shed. And maybe he'll change. Well, sure enough, exactly what Paul said, he was the greatest. The guy repented and wanted to come back and he was broken and he had repented of his sin and the Corinthians had gotten legalism in between getting rid of this guy and they didn't want to take him back and Paul said listen take the guy back he's going to commit suicide he's going to be overcome with horrible emotions Greek word pasco horrible negative passions are going to take this guy no take him back he repented grace still covers him grace covers all Christians who are willing to change and willing to repent 100% and God is not sitting around pointing out your fault the devil is okay now that's a different Bible study I don't have any time for that he'll he'll nitpick you till till eternity I mean he's on you permanently your heavenly father's not he's trying to help you get better he's trying to get this thing fixed he doesn't want you to reap the horrors of what you're sowing. He wants you to come home and repent and be saved. Absolutely. This is a good teaching tonight, folks. Uh, we cannot continue in our sin. We need to repent. We need to make that change. And if, you have, uh, if you've been struggling in an area or you have uh, fallen at some point, the Lord will pick you back up. We've got to repent. You're going to probably need some deliverance. I always assume there's going to, there's a need for deliverance when we've opened the door to the enemy. Of course. Who hasn't opened the door or their ancestors? Yeah. Uh, no, thank God for his grace and mercy, though. And um, Amen. I praise God for that, or I would have been a goner a long time ago. Uh, oh, but man, there, there I'll come, join you. There does come a time, though. We've got to really understand this. In the last days, Jesus said, I would that you were hot or cold because you're lukewarm. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And I believe that's talking about the church. There's a lot of people taking the mercy and grace of God for granted. And uh, they're in a lukewarm position tonight. And that's a very dangerous place to be. You've got cracks in your armor. You've got an open door. The enemy's going to use that to his advantage. Try to take you and I out. And I believe as it talks about, uh, you know, the last days. And if we live long enough to see the mark of the beast system. There's going to be a lot of those lukewarm Christians tapping out. You know, they get offended when persecution, tribulation come for the cause of the gospel. If you go back and look at that uh, parable of the sower, uh, with a non, a non with joy, they received the gospel, but they didn't have any root. When persecution, tribulation came for the cause of Christ, they fell away. They got offended. And uh, it's a dangerous thing to play with sin, folks. Uh, we need to make a decision. Are we going all in or not? Lukewarm will get you killed. If you live long enough, the devil has taken many people out in a body bag. And, you know, brother, sometimes um, people may take, the, you know, some of these statements I've made like this wrong. But, you know, uh, God is calling all to holiness. He says, be ye holy as I'm holy, saith the Lord. Wash yourself, make yourself clean. I thought I was in a position one time, brother, 
that I, w- I had everything going right for the Lord, and I was trying my best, but you know, there were still some things that I, you know, I was deceived about. And the Lord rebuked me with that word one night, and uh, I said, boy, I need to pray some more. Lord, show me where I need to repent, and I need to deal with it. You know, he that sinned, he that knoweth to do good and doeth not to him, it is a sin, folks. So once we're, we're made aware of the truth, we, we, need to, we need to live according to God's word the best we can. If we fall, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I guess uh, suffice to say, don't take the Lord's grace and mercy for granted. Uh, Amen. Very dangerous to do that. And you know, brother, um, I found some things in the King James Bible that I would like to see fixed if I live long enough. You know, I'm going to try to um, <clears throat> work myself up a uh, King James Bible. And I'm going to replace the name of, uh, put God's name in there where you see capital L O R D, for example. Yeah, right. I was looking up Palestine. You know, I found Palestine only one time in the whole King James Bible. There were no ancient Palestinians. Never been a Palestinian king or Palestinian currency. That's more of a recent invention, if you will. And, uh, you know, there's this battle going on over in uh, Gaza right now. Uh, You look in the Word of God, God deeded that to Israel. And before that, you know, uh, you go back in history, you see Palestine mentioned one time. What was mistranslated? I looked at the Hebrew the other day. It's Philistia. The Philistines. We see where the Philistines occupied that land at one time. God said, because of their wickedness, I'm taking it away from you, and I'm taking it away from them, and I'm going to give it to Israel. And, uh, you know, there's an age-old battle. This goes back thousands of years uh, going on over there. So I I see some things that um, uh, the, the English translators did the best they could and I still will stand by the King James. I believe it's the best Bible on the market that we've ever been offered in the English language. Uh, because when you look back I love 100, it. the 100 years ago, you had Horton Westcott come into the picture. Right. Uh, th- these guys were... Uh, th- these guys did not use a majority text. They used, the, they used the minority to make their critical text. Right. Based on what, 45 scrolls or so? And they pulled in the... Uh, the Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus that came out of Alexandria. Thousands of changes in the New Testament between their version and the King James. And one of these guys was uh, a necromancer. He would, he would talk to the spirits of the dead in church by himself at night. This is documented. Um, and their sons wrote books about both those guys. Those guys were compromised. And just about every major version that's come out since is based on the work that those guys did. People thought, oh, this is the greatest thing since white bread. Let's dump the King James and throw that under the bus and jump over and go with Horton Westcott's critical text. And there's people that can explain it more eloquently than I can. But as I begin to look into the matter, I think the Catholic Church basically recaptured all the Bibles, Michael. They even got the new King James. The most recent version, as I understand it, they dumped the the um, majority text and they went back to the Codex Vaticanus. And I think that the uh, Catholic Church has been very angry since uh, Protestantism broke out and they lost control of the Bible where they had previously locked up in Latin and you'd go to the Latin Mass. Who speaks Latin? It's a dead language. But <laughs> you had to wait for the priest to translate that to you. And then... Uh, you know, you had all these uh, modern Bibles begin to uh, be produced and distributed, and they've never been happy ever since. Uh, they have effectively, and I believe that uh, Horton Westcott were probably working with uh, the, the Catholic Church and the Jesuits. They came back in there, got control of the Bible, even got the new King James, and, you know, you've got the uh, the King James of that's been the standard for about 400 years, about the last man standing. Now, I don't ask everybody to agree with me, and that's not a, uh, it's not perfect, but uh, you can get to heaven reading the King James, and if we've got some things we need to fix, like you brought out tonight, so be it. As I mentioned, the King James has God's name, Yahovah, in there about four or five times. Why did we go over to capital L-O-R-D? 
and there is actually Hebrew Torah scrolls, including the Aleppo Codex, Leningrad Codex, and about 5,000 more that have been found over the last 20 years that the scribes did not blot out the name of God, the Tetragrammaton. People did the best they could, and they thought, oh, well, maybe it's Yahweh. But we now know, because of the Masoretic Hebrew, how to spell and how to pronounce God's name. The King James had it right all along, Jehovah. Except, you know, there's no J in Hebrew, so it's actually Y. Yehovah. So that's something that I want to do. You know, kings back then were ordered in Scripture. You had to actually um, write out your own Bible. That was an order by God. And uh, whether he wanted you to do it by hand or hire a scribe to do it, they were supposed to print their own uh, Scriptures. And I thought, well, that's that's actually that's not a bad idea. Uh, we take the Bible for granted. And uh, we certainly don't study it like we should, many of us. What if you had to actually go in there and, and, um, and write your own copy? And so what I'm going to do is I'm trying to get a hold of the actual Cambridge. I contacted them last week. Uh, there are some pretty good ones. There's one called the Cambridge Pure Edition. And it's probably an exact carbon copy. But I just wanted to see if uh, I could get Cambridge over in England to release a PDF of the Bible which I think is the best King James you can get out there, uh, you know, the standard edition. I don't need any um, commentary on it. And then I was going to take it, put it into a word processor. I'm going to go in there and fix the name. So praise the Lord. Uh, at any rate, that I just took a rabbit trail. That wasn't what this program's about tonight. But, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Palestine, I found it only one time over in Joel. It's actually Felicia. Look what you found over there, my brother. And uh, you, how did you come across this? Uh, was it your own st- was it your own study and research? And you said, "Hey, let me go look up the Greek for this." Yeah, well, I took Greek in Bible college, so I I kind of cross referenced it all the time in my teachings on Friday night. So you can, uh, when I do the Bible studies, uh, YouTube dot com slash House of Healing AZ every Friday night at seven seven o'clock Pacific time. I think we're getting ready to change time zones. So oh, yes. I think pretty soon it'll be mountain time coming up. But anyway, 7 o'clock, uh, I'm teaching, in fact, this Friday, I have a seminar I'm teaching on uh, YouTube.com slash House of Healing AZ. It's on the invisible world. And oh. I go through the text and, and uh, kind of expose what we can't see. Truly really fascinating. You'll you'll enjoy that. But That's I use good. the King James all the time. I like it. Uh, I wasn't criticizing it. I was just uh, pointing out this one te- section of text. Yes. Just didn't quite come off right. And so if you clarify it a little bit, you can whip that rejection demon and stick it in his ear because uh, he uses that and tries to condemn people. He wants oh, to run people down. Oh, no, and I back you with what you said. Uh I praise God that he uh, preserved his word. And uh, it's interesting, uh, in closing comment, there's about a billion and a half Chinese now. And uh, there has actually been a work done a few years back where they took a King James and they produced a a more accurate rendering in Mandarin. So you can get the King James Chinese Bible now. They've got it in uh, Spanish, the Reign of Valera Gomez version 2010. And uh, there's a guy working on the Indonesian version right now. Sadly here, Brother Michael, in this country where I live, the largest Muslim population in the world, they're reading a Bible they call the Al-Kitab, which means the book. And in the church, people pray to a God called Allah, who the Muslims will rightfully tell you has no son. Why is the Christian church praying to a uh, God of Islam whose symbol is the crescent moon, who has no son. Apostasy? Well, I I finally dug it out. They had an Indonesian a Muslim on the Bible committee, and when they got to the decision of how to translate God, he said, well, most Muslims, you know, believe Allah is God, so why don't we just go with Allah? Brother, what heresy? Wow. You've got Christians over here praying to the Muslim God Allah who has no son. It's very sad. That's why I'm a stickler. Very. Um, God was able to preserve his name. We know it. We know how to spell it, pronounce it now. Why not put it back in the book? I don't know why the King James did it, other than that, which is probably politically correct. Then, you know, as the Jews do today. 
They don't like to pronounce the name. Right. They just go with Hashem. Or, you know, Adonai for God. But, you know, God is, uh, there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And, uh, you know, uh, once we know it, I'm like, hey, there's nothing to stop me from printing out my own copy with God's name restored. What the heck? I'm going to go for it. It's on my bucket list. Um, and, you know, listen, God has a standard. It's called holiness. Uh, we need to repent. We need to come clean with the Lord, know that he has grace and mercy available. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But once you know this, don't con- continue in that sin, folks. You're playing with your very life in your hands. If we continue to do this, there comes a point in time, too, also, Michael, can God turn a person over to be a reprobate? Well, that's another Bible study. Answer to that, yes. <laughs> I don't want to any, see anybody get there, but, <laughs> oh, yes, it can happen. As Jesus said, he himself is going to sort things out in the last days. Be hot or cold, or he's going to spit us out of his mouth. Do not be lukewarm, that's for sure. Um, and there are people out there that are doing that. And, you know, I... Brother, I can't handle somebody tell me there's no standard of righteousness, or we don't have God's word today, or God, you know, God has changed, and you know, you can live any way you want. Once saved, always saved. You know, everybody is going to get saved and get in. Adolf Hitler's going to be saved. I mean, there's so much confusion out there. We even got a group that say we're living in the new millennial reign of Christ. All of yeah. Revelation's already been revealed. Well. Have you have you seen Jesus over there on the throne in Jerusalem yet? Ruling and reigning from Mount Zion? I'm looking. I haven't seen him, Brother Michael. <laughs> so I miss it. A- absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you know, just to belabor my point here, uh, and I'm not going to mention a name. Uh, you can look on the big televangelist scene out there, and there's people that are getting married and they're going into adulterous situations. There's one that just got married. Her husband died, which makes her a widow and she can marry. She married a former sex therapist. He says he's a Christian and he just left his wife Oops. and then married the other. Now, I don't think there was any uh, adultery that would have given him grounds to leave the wife. Another one, a famous lady, uh, married this dude who's a, a former rock star. And he left his wife. And she wasn't cheating on him. He probably cheated on her. So can he go and marry this, this other lady who in turn left her husband? And they just said, you know, we both agreed. Uh, it wasn't for any kind of uh, sexual adultery. We just didn't want to live together anymore. What's up with this, Brother Michael? We ought to be able to look at something and call that sin. But not in much of today's church. They think, well, for, there's no fornication, adultery anymore. You know, you can just go and live like you want to live, and you're going to make it to heaven. We can't keep doing that, can we? No. I mean, this is a ser- this is serious business, because this is what's being sold to the masses out there. And uh, I like your message tonight. Look, we- hey, I don't know anybody who's perfect who hasn't sinned. I sinned. I don't try to do it, and if I realize I keep falling into the same thing, then I've got a real problem. You know, I can up and make a mistake, like anybody can. But if I want to continue in that sin, uh, I mean, I'm going to be turned over. The enemy is going to have a a legal right to come in and attack me. If I die in that sin, I'm going to bust hell wide open. I need to repent. I probably need deliverance too. And God will forgive. Thank God for his mercy and grace. But don't play around with it. Um, I've said enough tonight. Another time, um, uh, I want you to cover some of these other uh, topics. Brother Michael, um, I'm making up a schedule for November. And it's wide open. Okay. Would you look at it and get me some dates? I'll do uh, that. Also, before we close, uh, what shall we title tonight's broadcast? What would, what would you like to put as a title for your teaching tonight? Well, that's a good one. Uh, that was a long Bible study. <laughs> that was a long Bible study. Uh, see, a great Bible study. Whew. 
and you know I've really been trying to uh, be a better student of the Bible and hey I'm not going to lie to you I come across things that just don't make sense that's where we've got to get in there and do some word study I like what you did because not the the, uh, the Bible that has the problem it's us and our understanding and there could be again a translation issue you know I didn't learn until a few years ago brother that even the King James, uh, there was a reason for the these and thys and thous and the yees. And we got people that would just offhandedly throw it on the bus and say, that's just all archaic. Well, you got to understand, as I found out, now I understand that in the original Greek, you can have single or plural for each word. And if you don't correctly transmit that into English, you could have the different audience and be talking about a singular where it was meant to be plural or vice versa. Therefore, there was a, a good reason that they put in those extra pronouns. And so I, I can see where there's going to be some issues sometimes when you're bringing it over from the Greek and the Hebrew into the, the other languages like English. And uh, if, there's a, if there's an error, we go in, go in there, we fix it. You know, through the study, you got the understanding now of these verses that you were bringing out tonight. Um, you're in no means, by any means, throwing out the King James. You're just saying, "Hey, there was a, there's, there's something here that it was a mistranslation, and I found it, found it in the Greek, and now I understand it." Um, well, well, it may not have been mistranslated. It just wasn't uh, completely translated to reflect the full meaning of the text. That's all it was. Well, there we are. But there's also some words that look almost identical, but they have different meanings in the Greek, yeah. right? Yeah, right, exactly. That's yeah. what I was trying to clarify. Absolutely. So, uh, hey, I can work with that. And that's what we'll, you know, you, you work through is you're studying to show yourself approved. A workman that needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the, the word of truth. That's what you're doing, and I appreciate that about you. Uh, Brother Michael, also, excuse me, if someone wants to make contact with you in your ministry or get some help, how can they do that? Oh, it's uh, easy to do. Um, HardcoreChristianity.com is a website. We have a counseling center in Phoenix, so if you're coming to Arizona and you'd like to be seen be for a private uh, healing and deliverance session, just give me a call on the ministry line. It's 602-636-5800. And then we have two live services every week where we have teaching and then we go into the healing and deliverance service Thursday and Friday nights at 7 o'clock Pacific time. You can watch it live if you want to on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash houseofhealingaz. And if you send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com, I'll send you the uh, code and the password to our Zoom deliverance services. We have Monday nights for the ladies and Wednesday nights for men and women, 6 o'clock Pacific time. So if you can't come for a visit, to get healed, you can get healed on the Zoom on Monday and Wednesday nights. That's excellent. Also, there are times where someone may need some um, one-on-one help and maybe some extended help up there. Uh, are there are there ways that they can um, get up there and get some help? Do you have facilities for people that want to get out to Arizona? Yeah, we have a residential center next to the uh, deliverance center where people come in for two or three days and they they spend uh, go through healing and deliverance it's not a long term residential facility it's only short term okay absolutely and um, I know of a hardcore case right now that I actually referred uh, your ministry name to them and uh, I hope that uh, they'll take me up on that and make contact with you because uh, we got a situation that's uh, very okay. bad and uh, they're going to need some help and I see the uh, results that you're getting you all know what you're doing. You're getting results. I praise God for your ministry. Also, if people want to support you financially, do you have PayPal or any other way to do it? Well, sure. Um, we have a Tithely app you can download, and then on the website we have a PayPal button you can donate to. We thank you for that. I guess the title would be uh, Love Covers a Multitude of Sins. How's Ooh, that sound? That's a great one. That's a great one. And um, <laughs> All right. Michael, uh, one of these days, I uh, also want you to give some more of your testimony. Um, okay. Because I think you mentioned, um, as a young man, uh, did you ever get out to any of the uh, tent meetings of A.E. Allen or anything like that? 
No, uh, my testimony on, uh, on, on the YouTube channel is uh, Brother Mike Meets Catherine Kuhlman. That's the one. <laughs> as, a teen, as a teenager, I was in one of her services, and I went into it in detail in that one video. And uh, I cried and laughed my way all the way through it. It was amazing. That's pretty cool. But, I mean, you're up there in a place, uh, Arizona, where uh, there's been a lot of great evangelists headquartered and yes. through there. And uh, have you been there most of your life? Are you an Arizona boy? Uh, no, I'm from Kansas, but I moved out here in 1980. Oh. Yeah, we've had we got Bob Larson here. We we had Don Stewart here. A. A. Allen was here. Um, we have uh, a lot of prophetics here that are there in Phoenix. So this is kind of a hotbed of spirituality in this area. Yes, it is. Listen, thank you for going over time with me, and uh, God bless you, my friend. Excellent teaching today, as always. You get great teachings from Michael. W. Smith, and uh, my friend, um, thank you again. Look at your schedule and look forward to seeing you back in November if you got some time for me. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Bye-bye. Folks, that was Michael W. Smith. What do you think about that teaching today? Hey, that makes sense. And uh, I love the King James Bible. That's the only one that I'm going to read until Jesus comes back. Uh, I do come across some passages that I need some clarification on. And I have no problem uh, checking some of the other versions just to see what they had, they had there. And the other day I was looking at one and I had to actually go into the Hebrew. And I said, let me just look this up. And uh, I did, and that's where I found that word Palestine. It was actually Philistia. Philistine. And I said, well, now that makes sense. Because there was no other reference to Palestine in, in the King James Bible. And now some of the modern versions, you'll you'll see them begin to drop that in there. And that's wrong to do that. Uh, people are just making assumptions or they just decide to go that route and there's no historical basis for it. Now, you can get in trouble doing that. And you can get off some you know doctrinal error too in a lot of these newer versions. Uh, they've even got one version out there that says uh, um, it wasn't Goliath that uh, David killed. Uh, excuse me, it wasn't David who killed Goliath. It was another guy named Elhanan. And of course that's not the case, but uh, it just shows you they were using a bad Greek text. So, yeah, I'm a stickler for that. I'm going to defend the King James Bible, and um, if there's some places that we can clean up some of the verses where there was a a bad rendering done or they didn't flesh it out enough like uh, Michael has found, then so be it. Praise God for that. God, God's not confused. Uh, man is the one that has issues and so um, that's that's why it's important to get in there and study and I'm sure if we do that we will find the answers Michael found the answer for those passages that were uh, didn't seem to be making sense as you you read them off offhand um, and again I thank God that he has preserved his word 